Welcome all to this very special co-hosted webinar between Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News and Clinical Omics entitled Combinatorial Immunotherapy Approaches for Patients with Advanced Solid Tumors. This webinar was made possible through sponsorship from UltaView. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar, Jeff Bogaliskis. I'm the technical editor for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News which has embarked on its 40th anniversary year, covering all aspects of the life sciences industry. Over that time span, Jen has been witness to some outstanding scientific innovations, many of which are saving lives, especially for those suffering from cancer. About five years ago, the Jen team saw the need to devote more coverage to the amazing research in the translational medicine space and how omic technologies were most assuredly carving out their niche in clinical settings, hence the birth of Clinical Omics Magazine. Our presentation today falls squarely into the interest areas for both the Gen and Clinical Omics audiences. Our presenters are here today to tell us about some fascinating new data around immunotherapy treatment strategies involving the intratumoral administration of autologous, non-manipulated myeloid dendritic cells in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors in patients with advanced solid tumors. This is one of the most exciting and promising areas of cancer research currently, and our presenters today are going to show us just why that is. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Angela Vasatoro is a Senior Field Application Specialist at UltaView. Angela will start off the presentations by telling us the current state of the histopathological methods used to address the complexities of the tumor microenvironment. We'll then turn the presentation over to Dr. Julia Schwarzer, a physician and PhD candidate in the Department of Medical Oncology at the University Hospital Brussels. Julia will present her immunotherapy data using combinatorial approaches to help patients with advanced stage cancers. But before we begin, I want to remind the audience to stick around for a Q&A session that will occur right after the last presentation. You can send in a question at any time for our panelists today. It's really simple. All you need to do is click the Ask a Question tab on the right-hand side of your screen, type in your question, and hit Submit. We're going to try to get to as many of your questions as possible, so don't be shy. Send in any question you might have. All right, now that we got that all out of the way, I uh, will turn the floor over to our first presenter. Angela? Thanks for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Before moving into the main topic of today's webinar with uh, Julia, I would like to give a brief introduction on the tumor microenvironment complexity and uh, on the current histopathological methods uh, to address it. So this is a very elegant representation of the tumor microenvironment complexity, which captures all the different cell types that are making the tumor microenvironment, which are not only tumor cells, but also a lot of uh, immune cells uh, together with um, um, extracellular matrix, but also, and we will leave much more later on during the presentation uh, of Julia, about uh, soluble factors and the uh, molecules that are expressed on each of those cell subtypes, and also um, factors that can be released by each of those uh, different immune cell types. So as you can see, this is a very uh, complex structure um, and therefore it's quite difficult to gain understanding in the mechanisms uh, that are uh, ongoing in the tumor microenvironment and then uh, that drive, for example, escape um, uh, mechanism or uh, that can eventually uh, lead to uh, a good uh, response to immunotherapy, for example. This slide uh, shows uh, different types of immune stains that are used in immunohistochemistry to analyze morphological features, cellular structures, and uh, different cell types. So the most popular of the staining methods for routine diagnosis is what you see on the left side, so uh, the um, hematoxylin and deosinin staining, which is mainly used to assess cellular and morphological features identify the type of tissue and also the pathological changes. So the use of the h &E staining has been so far the most effective and common procedure for pathological diagnosis of cancer. Next to the um, h &E, uh, we can add in a single protein detection with the chromogenic IHC standard method. 
And um, depending on the type of marker we use, we will then be able to identify a specific cell population. However, uh, with uh, this uh, regular IHC, it is impossible to assess co-localization of markers at the single cell level. Uh, and uh, the staining of multiple markers is performed usually on consecutive sections. So this is really a big limit to look at uh, uh, co-localizing markers that are sometimes necessary to um, identify a specific cell type. Um, uh, this limitation is, uh, of course, uh, uh, overcome by multiplex IHC, which allows to look at multiple proteins rather than only one, and therefore allows a deeper cell type characterization and a better understanding of uh, pathological processes like cancer. Then, on top of this, being fluorescent, we can also add the range of expression for each of the biomarkers. And um, since we are looking at multiple cell subtypes, we can also assess their spatial interactions. Although the benefits of using multiplex IHC for a better understanding of the tumor microenvironment are now very clear, in the past, developing multiplex assay has been quite difficult and time consuming. AltiView has made a multiplex very simple now, and you can move from tissue to data in a one day workflow. Staining now only takes five hours and a half, and uh, with the Altivio technology, you do not need any assay development or optimization of your panel. Uh, they are all ready to use. Then you can perform, uh, after the five hours and a half, you can perform whole slide imaging, which depending on the tissue size can take 15, 20 minutes. And then the same day, you can now move to image analysis with any image analysis software you already have available. The initial Altivir offering has been built around T cells due to the fact that they, they have a really central role in the immune responses to tumor. And um, these immune responses can be mediated by the uh, interaction of, this, of the T cells with the other immune cell types like uh, macrophages, myeloid derived suppressor cells, dendritic cells, etc. But can also be mediated by the expression or release of uh, uh, other different molecules. And we will hear more uh, about this in, in the next presentation. So AltiView has currently available different ready-to-use multiplex kits that answer the main biological questions around the cells and pathways that are crucial in responses to tumor and therefore are also targets of immunotherapy. And in the next presentation, we will hear about the application of one or uh, two of those kits in, in the context of a, of a clinical trial. These off-the-shelf kits include um, a TIAD kit uh, and an APC to look at the T-cell activation and professional antigen-presenting cells that can guide their activation, uh, MDSCs and TIRA kits to look at uh, immune suppression in the tumor microenvironment, and PD-1 and PDL-1 kits to study T-cell exhaustion and tumor evasion. In addition to the off-the-shelf kits that I have uh, briefly introduced you to, you can now pick your markers of choice and build your custom kit containing up to eight markers. This is what we call our UView offering, where you can choose among markers that are already available in, in our biomarker menu, but you can also have us develop uh, a new, completely new marker um, uh, and uh, have it uh, um, in, a in a format of a kit that is basically, uh, again, once more ready to use. In this last couple of minutes, I, I would like to uh, focus uh, on uh, one of the kits that uh, has been used in the uh, clinical trial that, uh, that you will hear of uh, in the next presentation, which is the PDL1 kit. So uh, this is a kit that includes uh, four different markers, uh, CD8 for cytotoxic T cells, CD68 for macrophages, uh, PDL1, and then a tumor marker, which is a cocktail of pancytokeratin and uh, SOX10, which is particularly useful when you are working on a trial with solid tumors, uh, which includes also melanoma that uh, does not express pancytokeratin, but uh, SOX10 in, in the nucleus. So, and with, the, with this kit, I would like to also highlight a couple of the advantages 
uh, of using uh, the um, ulti mapper kits um, which are not only focused in, on the fact that you can now uh, with just four markers based on the combination that has been chosen uh, you can identify uh, many different phenotypes for example uh, with this specific kit you can look at um, um, immune suppressive macrophages that express uh, cd68 and pdl1 you can also look at uh, um, uh, carcinoma or melanoma cells that ex express either pancytokeratin or SOX10, but you can also look at the immune evading tumor cells that express uh, together with the uh, pancytokeratin or SOX10, also the PDL1 and so on. So really to highlight that uh, what, what matters is the combination of markers that gives you the best phenotypes and uh, that are interesting for your um, uh, study. On this same tumor and uh, stained with the same kit, with the PDL1 kit, I would like to highlight the value of uh, whole slide imaging. We are all well aware of the fact that uh, tumors can be highly heterogeneous, and therefore we want to avoid introducing additional, additional biases uh, by selecting specific region of interest. And um, I'm going to show you how selecting uh, different areas can really affect the type of uh, uh, conclusions that you make in, uh, in your study. I'm going to select here a region on the left side on the tumor and another one on the same slide, same tumor, but this time at the right side of the tumor. If I compare them, uh, you see that uh, by using also the same markers on the left side, you have a very high expression of PDL1 on the tumor cells that you see here in pinkish coming from a combination of cyan and red. But if I take an image from the same tumor, this time on the other side of the slide, you can clearly see that uh, uh, the tumor cells do not express PDL1. So again, highlighting the fact that it's critical to look at the entire slides uh, uh, rather than selecting region of interest. Another advantage of using uh, the uh, in situ plex technology is uh, the preservation of the tissue architecture and the cellular morphology. So um, one of the major challenges of the multiplex IHC so far has been uh, to enable multiplexing of different biomarkers while retaining the, the advantages of uh, um, HNE in terms of uh, uh, morphological information. And, um, uh, now the uh, Altivio and Cituplex technology allows the combination of H&E and fluorescence staining on the same slide. So what you see here on this slide on the left side is again one uh, tumor sample stained with the same PDL1 kit, and on the right side you see the same exact slide uh, stained with the H&E after the fluorescence staining has been performed. Here I'm going to zoom on one little region of those uh, two images that I have previously shown you uh, and where you can see the fluorescent staining with uh, the same markers uh, I have described before of the PDL1 kit and then the corresponding H&E on the exact same slide and then you can see if you turn them back and forth you can see that uh, the tissue morphology uh, the, the tissue architecture and the cellular morphology are fully preserved. So uh, uh, histopathological analysis by a pathologist really today represents the only method for confirmation of presence or absence of disease uh, and also measurement of disease progression, for example. So therefore, allowing a pathologist to add precisely on an H&E slide, the subtype of infiltrating cells stained by multiplex fluorescent IHC can deliver a more accurate prognostic and patient stratification pro for treatment, um, integrating cell level information with the context specific information of the microenvironment that come from an H&E. And um, uh, with this, um, I'll pass it on to uh, Julia, to hear uh, how she has been also able to apply the, the Ultima Propedial One kit uh, into her research. Thanks, Angela. Wonderful presentation and a great way to start things off. 
To the audience, uh, quickly, I just want to remind you to stay tuned for the Q&A session that's going to occur right after the next presentation. Again, to ask a question to either of our presenters, you can send them in at any time. All you need to do is click the Ask a Question tab on the right-hand side of your screen, type in your question, and hit Submit. Okay, Julia, I will now turn the mic over to you. Hello, my name is Julia Schwarze, and first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar for the opportunity to talk about our combinational immunotherapy approaches for patients with advanced solid tumors. So I will talk about our uh, early phase clinical trials on intratumoral administration of myeloid dendritic cells in combination with other immunotherapies. These are my disclosures. We know that cancer cells can release tumor-associated antigens, and these antigens can be taken up by dendritic cells in the tumor-draining lymph nodes. These dendritic cells then present the tumor antigens through the major histocompatibility complex to naive T cells. These then get activated, and the activated cytotoxic T lymphocytes can then recognize the tumor antigens on the surface of the cancer cells and fight these cancer cells by, for instance, releasing interferon gamma and also other factors. However, the tumor microenvironment has found its ways to avoid this anti-tumor response, for instance, by upregulating immune checkpoints, such as PDL1. But there are also other immunosuppressive cells in the tumor microenvironment, such as regulatory T cells. In the past few years, it has been shown that there are different targets in, the, in this um, cancer immunity cycle that can be targeted to, um, to induce anti-tumoral immune responses, such as um, the immune checkpoint inhibitors anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1, anti-CTLA-4. But there are also uh, treatment uh, modalities such as adoptive TIL therapy or dendritic cell therapy. And we will talk about dendritic cell therapy today. It is important to mention that um, cancer cells have an intrinsic way to, to exclude um, myeloid dendritic cells in the, in the tumor microenvironment, uh, for instance, by um, the activation of the WNT beta catenin pathway. It has been shown by single cell RNA sequencing that there are different kinds of uh, dendritic cells in the human uh, peripheral blood. And there are two types of uh, dendritic cells, the classical type 1 uh, and type 2 dendritic cells, or also called myeloid dendritic cells, um, that are uh, playing an important role in the um, anti-cancer immunity. And it is possible to uh, isolate um, these types of uh, dendritic cells from the peripheral blood of, uh, of humans through leukapheresis and isolation procedures. But first, let's have a closer look to, uh, into these um, den myeloid dendritic cells and why they are so important in the anti-cancer immunity. So it has been shown that in the tumor myelid compartment, there are rare activating antigen-presenting cells that are critical for T-cell immunity. And the pivotal role has been attributed to the CD103 expressing or CD141 expressing uh, dendritic cells bearing CCR7 for tumor antigen trafficking and priming of T-cell immunity in melanoma. Across multiple mouse tumor models and human tumor biopsies, the intratumoral dendritic cell subpopulation uh, has been uh, delineated as being distinct from macrophage populations. And within uh, these uh, dendritic cell populations, CD103 positive dendritic cells are extremely sparse, yet remarkably capable of uh, stimulating cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And these are uniquely dependent on, uh, on several transcription factors, especially BATF3. They can be generated by GMCSF and FTL3L cytokines. And it has also been shown that regressing tumor have higher proportions of these cells. And it has also been shown that T cell dependent immune clearance relies on these CD103 dendritic cells. The abundance of their transcripts in human tumors correlates with clinical outcome and therefore 
This setup represents uh, opportunities for prognostic as well as therapeutic approaches across multiple cancer types. It has also been shown that the expansion and activation of CD103 dendritic cells, such uh, for instance through the administration of FLT3 ligand, um, that the enhance uh, that the expansion and activation of these dendritic cells um, enhances tumor responses to uh, therapeutic anti pdl one therapy, but also BRAF inhibition in, in a murine mouse model. And it is also important to, to mention that um, the successful anti pd one cancer immunotherapy, so the immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, targeting anti pd one require a T-cell dendritic, a T -cell dendritic cell crosstalk that involves the cytokines interferon gamma and interleukin-12. So this was for the type um, 1 dendritic cell, myelodendritic cells, but there's also been attributed an important role to the type 2 myelodendritic cells. Um, these cells um, have been shown to, to drive protective anti-tumoral CD4 T-cell immunity. Um, and also it has been shown that human um, CD1C myelodendritic cells secrete high levels of interleukin-12 and potently prime cytotoxic T-cell responses. So to recap, there are two important types of myeloid or conventional dendritic cells. The conventional type 1 dendritic cell is a potent primer of CD8 cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, with antitumoral effects, and the conventional type 2 dendritic cell potently primes antitumoral CD4 T cell responses. The nomenclature is a little bit confusing, so I, I summed it up here. Um, so the conventional type 1 dendritic cells are characterized in the murine setting by the expression of CD103, Whereas in the human setting, the um, CDC1 is um, characterized by CD141 BDCA3 expression. And the conventional uh, type 2 dendritic cells are characterized uh, in the murine setting by CD11B expression and CD1C or BDCA1 uh, expression in the human setting. So these um, myeloid dendritic cells, these natural occurring dendritic cells, have gained a lot of interest uh, in, the, in the dendritic cell vaccine um, research. And uh, like previously, a lot of uh, research has been done uh, regarding monocyte-derived dendritic cells. The past few years, um, a lot of research groups have uh, found interest in using these uh, natural occurring conventional dendritic cells in, in a DC vaccine, for instance, in melanoma and in, in prostate cancer. And it has been shown that uh, it uh, leads to uh, anti-tumoral immune effects uh, and also uh, clinical responses. However, these uh, dendritic cells, uh, these dendritic cell vaccines are ATMPs, so um, they are real vaccines. And we were thinking we could use these uh, natural occurring dendritic cells also locally, intratumorally, as a non-ATMP. So we um, set up two clinical trials, two early phase clinical trials, where we inject these dendritic cells isolated from the patient's uh, peripheral blood uh, in combination with um, immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, or TVEC and oncolytic virus. So let's start with our first uh, phase one clinical trial, MyDavipni, our pilot clinical trial. Um, in this clinical trial, um, patients were treated with intratumoral injections of um, avelumab, an anti pdl one monoclonal antibody, and ipilimumab, an anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody, um, followed by intratumoral injection of autologous non-manipulated um, BDCA1 myeloid dendritic cells, and this was combined with, a, uh, with uh, an intravenous infusion of low-dose nivolumab. For this clinical trial, um, all patients with advanced solid tumors 
who were progressive following standard of care treatment were eligible if they also had skin or lymph node or other soft tissue metastases that were amenable for biopsy and intratumoral injection. They also needed to have a good performance status and no prior grade 4 immune-related adverse events on immune checkpoint therapy. The objectives of this clinical trial were the safety and feasibility, with the endpoints being adverse events and treatment disposition. So actually, we uh, in November 2020, we just published um, the results of this clinical trial on our intratumoral combinational administration of uh, BDCA1 myeloid and radix cells in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we would like to discuss these results here today. So let's have a look at uh, the treatment schedule. Uh, so the patients will first undergo a leukapheresis procedure on day one. And a pharesis product will then be transferred to the stem cell laboratory where the cell isolation takes place. It takes about 36 hours. And also on day one in the afternoon, the patient will uh, get his first uh, treatment administration. Uh, that uh, means that he, will, he or she will have uh, intravenous administration of uh, low-dose knee volume up. Uh, and also the first injections of um, avilumab at a maximum total dose of 40 mg and of ipilimumab at a maximum total dose of 10 mg in selected metastatic lesions. And 24 hours later, upon um, isolation of the dendritic cells, um, the same lesions as the day before are injected with the dendritic cells. We were thinking about taking biopsies uh, or fine needle aspirates uh, before every new injection. Um, we uh, repeated the, the intratumoral injections of ipilimumab and avilumab every 14 days after the first injection. And uh, also the intravenous administrations of nivolumab were repeated every 14 days. And tumor response assessment was performed uh, using whole body PET CT every 12 weeks during the treatment phase. So let's have a look at our patient characteristics. Uh, the patients had a median age of 55 years, so they were not that old. Um, the, most of the patients were female, and almost all patients had a performance status of 0 to, uh, to 1. Yet there were also two patients with a slightly worse uh, performance status, yet they were included in this clinical trial. Uh, it is important to mention that these patients were heavily pre-treated with a median of four prior lines of systemic therapy. And the prior types of systemic therapy included targeted therapy, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy. Um, so all patients uh, who were eligible for uh, immunotherapy before already uh, had immunotherapy. Um, the primary tumor types uh, were cutaneous melanoma. There were four patients. Uh, three patients had triple negative breast carcinoma. And there were also one patient each with a serous uh, ovarian carcinoma and an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. And in five patients, the, prior, the lesion uh, that was injected was priorly um, irradiated with stereotactic body radiotherapy. Um, however, this was not immediately before uh, inclusion in this clinical trial. It was already um, several months ago. And when we look at the treatment-related adverse events, uh, we can conclude that um, the adverse events were mainly low-grade and um, there were, we did not observe any grade 4 or 5 adverse events. Uh, and only one or two grade three uh, adverse events. Uh, so they were pretty low grade. Um, there were, we observed immune-related adverse events such as pruritus, uh, rash. Um, we also observed the uh, pneumonitis in two patients and um, uh, bullous pemphigoid in one patient and also colitis, immune-related colitis in one patient. And the other type of, the other type of um, treatment-related adverse events was um, injection site reactions, such as injection site pain, injection site redness, and also rush locally, and some flu-like symptoms. 
when we look at tumor responses, we can uh, say that there was one stage four melanoma patient who previously progressed on anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibodies who developed a partial response upon study treatment that was also quite durable with 10 months. Uh, we have to say that um, most of the other patients um, had progressive disease, uh, although they had um, a reduction in their injected lesions. However, they had um, new lesions, had developed new lesions or uh, other pre-existing lesions that were increased in volume again. So they were overall progressive. And there was also a breast cancer patient uh, who developed a mixed response. Uh, so she also had um, a decrease in volume or even a disappearance of, um, of non-injected metastasis. So here is a case illustration of the stage four melanoma patient. Uh, you can see here uh, the overview images of a PET scan. And you can see on, at the at baseline that um, there's only one tiny lesion in the right axilla uh, that was injected with the myeloid dendritic cells initially. And you can see at eight weeks already um, that um, the lesion in the inguinal crest left um, that was um, decreased in volume. Not shown here is that there are also uh, intestinal, le intestinal lesions uh, at baseline that have been regressed at this moment. And another 16 weeks later, you see that the lesion in the iliac crest even more um, uh, decreased in volume. And at 24 weeks, we were thinking, okay, so this is a little bit weird. Uh, this axillary node um, is still a little bit visible. So we performed uh, a first biopsy there, a fine needle aspiration actually. And uh, you can see here a tumor block of this fine needle aspiration that did not show any um, melanoma cells, uh, no malignant cells, however, only macrophages and melanophages, so macrophages loaded with pigment and uh, necrosis. And actually at this moment we decided to further inject the lesion um, of the iliac crest and before we started um, injecting these, this lesion, we also took uh, biopsies. So we tried to take biopsies before every new treatment administration in this, um, in this metastasis. And here you can see um, the tumor biopsies at baseline um, after second injection, so after four weeks, after the ninth injection, so after 30 weeks. And you can see CD8 and PDL1 immunohistochemistry uh, uh, staining. And we observed uh, that um, from a more cold tumor, so there were only a sparse uh, infiltration, there was only a sparse infiltration of, um, of lymphocytes at this moment at baseline, uh, that after the second injection, it was already increased as well as the PDL1 um, expression. And after um, the ninth injection, so after 30 weeks, um, there was much more CD8 infiltrate in the, in the tumor lesion and PDL1 upregulation was even more enhanced. And at this moment, we also, um, for the first time, did a multiplex immunofluorescent analysis to better understand the relationship between uh, CD8 T lymphocytes and the SOX10 positive um, melanoma cells. So this was for the first clinical trial. Um, now I will move on to our second uh, phase one Im uh, clinical trial, uh, MyDCTV. So in this uh, case, actually, um, patients were only melanoma. So only melanoma patients were um, eligible for um, pa taking part in this clinical trial. They also had to have uh, progressive disease following standard of care treatment. Of course, they also had to have skin, lymph node, or other soft tissue metastasis amenable for biopsy and intratumor injection. And so in this clinical trial, um, patients were treated with intratumor injection of TVEC and oncolytic virus. 
uh, and subsequently, subsequently um, followed by um, the injection of BDCA1 myelodendritic cells in the first three cohorts, and in the fourth cohort, uh, a combination product of BDCA1 and BDCA3 myelodendritic cells. So TVEC actually is an oncolytic virus, a first-in-class oncolytic virus um, that is based on the herpes simplex virus type 1, and it is supposed to be injected locally and tratumorally and to uh, infect only uh, tumor cells and then lysis tumor cells, thereby releasing tumor antigens, creating a, an, uh, in an inflamed tumor microenvironment, and um, thereby reinvigorating the cancer immunity cycle. So, so in this uh, trial, the patients also undergo uh, leukapheresis, and the apheresis product is then transferred to the stem cell laboratory again, where the isolation of BDCA1 myelodendritic cells or BDCA1, BDCA3 myelodendritic cell co-product took place. And in the afternoon, uh, the patient will get its first um, intratumor injection of TVEC. Uh, the injection volume was based on the lesion size, uh, as it is indicated for uh, the use of TVEC. And again, 24 hours later, uh, the same lesions as, the, as injected the day before are injected with a, a dendritic cell product. And, and also here we um, aimed at taking on-treatment biopsies before every treatment. Um, we used a vacuum cut needle or a punch biopsy in some cases. And um, every, on day 21 and every 14 days thereafter, intratumor injections of TVEC were repeated. Tumor response assessment was uh, again performed by using whole body PET CT every 12 weeks during the treatment phase. So as I already mentioned, there were three uh, cohorts uh, where the patients received only BDCA1 myelodendritic cells in a dose escalation scheme. And uh, in cohort four, um, BDCA1 and BDCA3 myelodendritic cells uh, were co-injected um, in all patients. And these patients received all isolated um, myelodendritic cells. If you look at the patient characteristics, um, we can say that um, the median age of the patients was 64 years old, ranging from 31 to 81. Most patients were female, all patients had a good performance status, and most of the patients had stage 4 melanoma. And uh, the study drug administration includes uh, the injected lesions with myelodendritic cells at baseline that was ranging from 1 to 5 injected lesions. And the number of times injected with TVEC um, was six, uh, range, ranging from three to eight injections. Um, as I said, for the first three cohorts, there was a dose escalation, and two patients each were treated in the first two cohorts, and three patients were treated in cohort three. And cohort four uh, received the full fraction of the BDCA1, BDCA3 myelodendritic cell co product. And in this um, uh, cohort, six, six patients were treated. Um, if we look at the previous therapies, uh, we see that all patients uh, previously received anti-PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors, um, and 12 patients also received CTLA-4 monoclonal antibodies. Um, there was one patient who had a grade 4 pneumonitis um, before being recruited uh, into our clinical trial, and at that moment it was uh, too dangerous to um, to administrate an uh, ipilimumab uh, because she would be at high risk for developing again a high-grade um, immune-related adverse event. And uh, five patients also received chemotherapy, more than one line, and all BRAF mutant uh, patients uh, received BRAF mec inhibition before. So also in this case, the, the treatment was quite um, safe. Uh, we mainly observed low-grade adverse events and constitutional symptoms such as fever, chills, flu-like symptoms, myalgia, 
but of course also in this case we observed some injection site reactions such as redness at the, at the injection site, inflammation, uh, injection site pain, uh, but also some gastrointestinal symptoms such as ab abdominal, abdominal pain, nausea and diarrhea. Um, there were two uh, very interesting adverse events um, that were not described before with TVEC monotherapy. And it was actually this hemorrhagic rush or purpura that was um, that um, was visible two two days approximately after the injection of the myelodendritic cells, uh, and was self-limiting and vanished approximately seven days later. Uh, this is actually a patient that um, went into complete remission uh, upon study treatment. And there was also a patient, uh, another patient that um, developed a complete remission on study treatment that developed um, um, an asymptomatic grade three um, eosinophilia in the blood. If you look at tumor responses, uh, we can conclude that there were, uh, in cohort three, there were two patients who developed a complete remission of their melanoma. Uh, so these patients only receive BDCA1 uh, myelodendritic cells. And in the fourth cohort, uh, receiving BDCA1, BDCA3 co-product, um, there were two patients uh, who had a complete remission of their injected lesions. Uh, however, uh, only one patient of these two uh, developed a partial response. Um, and uh, another patient, uh, the other patient with complete remission of his injected lesions developed a mixed response. The other patients um, had of some or some of other patients had stable disease or partial, a partial response in injected lesions um, and they were um, overall progressive. On this um, spider plot and this waterfall plot, you can see that the um, um, responses were quite deep, could be very deep, and they could be very uh, fast, very rapid responses and durable responses. Here's a case illustration of uh, one of the patients in core 3, a 80-year-old uh, female patient that was uh, progressive following pembrolizumab and ipilimumab. You can see here the clinical images uh, showing uh, the regression of the injected lesion. Uh, this is a lady who developed a grade 3 uh, blood eosinophilia. And interestingly, on the biopsies we also observed, you can see it here on the uh, HE uh, staining, um, there were also visibly uh, apparent um, uh, a couple of eosinophils in the tumor. And this is also one of the first patients where we, we performed um, the multiplex immunofluorescent analysis. Uh, we used two different kits, one kit for um, the visualization of antigen presenting cells and another one for the cytotoxic T lymphocytes and PDL1 expression. Uh, on the top of this slide, you can see on, uh, in a on treatment biopsy showing still some SOX10 positive melanoma cells. Um, but uh, areas where um, PDL1 expression was um, uh, elevated um, in contrast to uh, at baseline. And on the bottom of this uh, slide, you can see uh, actually the moment um, when the patient had clinically no evidence of disease anymore and also the PET-CT was clear. Uh, we took another biopsy and you can see here actually intact, intact skin with no um, uh, visible SOX10 melanoma cells anymore. And then I would like also to talk about uh, this case illustration, a 60-year-old female patient who was uh, progressive following pembrolizumab. So this was the patient who did not receive anti-CTLA-4 due to uh, a recent um, immune-related pulmonitis. Um, so this patient had a lot of intransit lesions on her right upper thigh, as you can see indicated by the arrow uh, at the baseline PET scan. And these um, yeah, lesions uh, vanished uh, throughout the treatment administration. And at 12 weeks, you can already see that there are no PET-AVID lesions anymore on the upper, upper thigh. 
However, there was a, uh, a new uh, lymph node that was PET active. Uh, at this moment, we, um, we decided that probably, most probably, this lesion will be um, uh, a reactive lymphadenopathy and not a melanoma metastasis. And we, were, uh, we introduced a watchful waiting situation. And as you can see, at 24 weeks and 36 weeks, um, this lymph node disappeared again. So here you can also see um, immunohistochemistry uh, and um, HE um, stainings of uh, a couple of um, tissue biopsies that we performed in this patient. Um, so the upper row is um, actually showing the baseline uh, tissue where you can see only very, very few CD8 T lymphocytes infiltrating the, the, the tumor tissue and a lot of tumor cells, so SOX10 is uh, uh, very positive here. And then you can see an on-treatment biopsy in the second row where you already see um, much more inflammation. Um, so there are in more infiltrating CD8 uh, T, uh, T lymphocytes and um, also SOX10 is a little bit less active here already. And the last row shows um, a tumor biopsy at the moment when um, there was uh, no evidence of disease anymore clinically or uh, on PET-CT. You, you see there are no SOX10 positive um, melanoma cells anymore, uh, but a lot of CD8 um, T lymphocytes are visible. So we decided to also do a multiplex immunofluorescence staining on tissue biopsies of uh, this patient to better understand the relationship between um, the immune cells and uh, melan uh, melanoma cells. And it's uh, nicely shown here that you can, yeah, you can quantify these uh, uh, infiltrating um, uh, immune cells. Uh, what we, what you can't do uh, with immunohistochemistry. Um, so uh, it's a nice tool to see how um, how many um, cells are infiltrating, what is their relationship with other immune cells. And I would like to uh, end this presentation by this case illustration. This is one of the uh, patients in court four. Um, you can see at baseline that um, he had a lot of intransit lesions on his uh, left upper thigh. Um, and you can see also a baseline biopsy showing almost no uh, CD8 T lymphocytes infiltrating the, the, tumors, uh, the tumor. Whereas uh, after seven injection, uh, injections, there was a lot of CD8 T lymphocytes infiltrating uh, the tumor. Uh, at this moment, actually, uh, he was in, uh, uh, in um, a mixed response. Uh, as you can see on this PET um, overview image. Um, so I didn't uh, add a photo here of the, of the clinical lesions, but um, at this moment he had a pathological com confirmed response uh, in, on his leg, on the intransit lesions. Uh, however, he developed a new lesion in his, um, in his uh, neck, uh, lymphadenopathy, uh, we took a biopsy there too, and we saw that there were also infiltrating T lymphocytes. However, there must be something that um, that uh, yeah that seems to avoid the immune system fighting the cancer cells there. So for this case, we think we will take another shot on the multiplex immunofluorescence to better understand what is happening in this in this tumor lesion. Why isn't it working here? So to conclude, I would like to say that uh, the intertumoral injection of autologous BDCA1 myelodendritic cells with or without uh, BDCA1, BDCA3 myelodendritic cells plus immune checkpoint inhibitors or TVEC is feasible, that it is safe with mainly manageable low-grade adverse events, and that it shows encouraging early signs of antitumoral responses in patients with previously, pro previously progressed on anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 immune checkpoint blockade, and that immunohistochemistry in multiplexed immunofluorescent performed on, on treatment biopsies could serve as a monitoring tool for treatment efficacy. 
I would like to thank the patients and the caregivers, our funding sources, uh, my colleagues from medical oncology department, uh, as well as our colleagues from the stem cell laboratory and the department of the anatomic pathology department of our uh, hospital. And I would like to thank you for your interest in this webinar. Wow, thanks, Julia. Amazing data. Uh, these approaches look really promising and we look forward to your future work. To the audience, stay with us. Q&A is about to begin in just a moment. Just want to remind you again to send in any questions you might have. No question is too small. All you need to do is click the Ask a Question tab on the right hand side of your screen, type in your question and hit submit. We're going to try to get through as many of your questions as possible. All right, with that said, and with the questions we have already, let's get to the Q&A session. Bear with us for just a moment as we transition into the Q&A. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us for the Q&A session. Uh, we have a bunch of really great questions, so let's get to them right away. One of our audience members would like to know, have you tried the PDL one kit for synovial tissue biopsies? Also, can you do co-localization analysis to make Z-stacks? Okay, can you hear me fine? <laughs> I, yep, I can hear you. Okay, so um, I should have mentioned actually that uh, we can apply all the Ultimapper kits on uh, any tissue that is uh, paraffin embedded. So if those synovial tissue biopsies would be uh, FFPE, there would be no problem. Um, and uh, also, if I can, we can do co-localization and uh, make ZStack. This was the second part of the question. So for the co-localization, definitely we can do, and this is what we always do and analyze. Um, I think I have mentioned a couple of the possible co-localization when we look at the PDL1 kit. But in principle, since we are only relying on the primary antibody staining, so we do not have at all a secondary antibody or anything else that can um, introduce like a steric hindrance. So we can look at uh, as many markers as we want on a subcellular location. So co-localization is something that we can easily look at and um, quantify. And um, uh, these tags we can do so, so, but we usually work with the uh, thin sections that are around four or five microns. So, um, I would say that normally we just take one layer when we do um, whole slide imaging, but if you really want to do uh, multiple layers, then you can you can do so. It would just increase your scanning time, and then eventually you can uh, do the uh, projections of those on a single layer. All right, great, thank you, Angela. Julia, do we have you back? Yes, you have me back. All right, all right, <laughs> great. <laughs> Uh, so, Julia, we had a question for you. Uh, it's a really good one here. Um, one of our audience members would like to know, um, why did you initially use, only use BDCA1 myeloid dendritic cells and not immediately the combination to treat patients? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because, uh, of course, I, I outlined in my presentation that both um, types of dendritic cells are very important, the BDCA1s and the, and the BDCA3s, and also that they have a complementary function. Uh, so why we uh, used only the BDCA1 myelodendritic cells in the beginning, it was because we were not able to isolate the BDCA3 myelodendritic cell fraction in a clinical grade manner um, at the moment when we uh, made up the con. So it, uh, it was actually a, a practical reason a little bit. So um, at that moment, we were not able to isolate the BDCA3 myelodendritic cell fraction, and uh, we were thinking we were start we would start with the BDCA1 fraction, and then later on, uh, at the moment when we would be able to induce both cell types, then we would amend our clinical trial uh, in order to use the combination. All right, great. Uh, we have a couple more questions for you here. Uh, one audience member would like to know, what should the perfect imaging platform be able to do or be uh, able to visualize, in your opinion, for your research? Yes. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think this question uh, de really depends on uh, every researcher's uh, interest. Uh, so in our case, of course, 
we really, really would like to visualize um, these subtypes of myelodendritic cells, the BDCA ones and the BDCA threes, maybe also other subtypes like the plasma cell to its dendritic cells. Um, but unfortunately, that is not yet possible with um, with this um, kit. It's only possible to to visualize. Um, dendritic cells or antigen presenting cells in general. Uh, so this would be a, a very nice thing for us to do, to also look at uh, baseline biopsies and to have a look whether these types uh, of BDCA1, BDCA3 mild dendritic cells are really in the tumor or not. All right, great. And one more question for you. Um, is there any uh, dendritic cell vaccine today that has shown efficacy and is used routinely in the clinics? Um, uh, yeah, so actually there is, uh, as I outlined also during my presentation, there's a lot of research um, around uh, dendritic cells. There was a lot of research around my, uh, monocyte-derived dendritic cells. Uh, in the past few years, there's much more interest in the natural occurring dendritic cells. Um, so there's actually um, today one uh, dendritic cell vaccine. Uh, it's called Provence or uh, Cipulose T that is um, available for um, stage four uh, re uh, hormone refractory prostate cancer patients. Um, so this is actually the only only dendritic cell vaccine um, today that has shown efficacy and improved overall survival in um, in the phase three in a, a randomized phase three clinical trial and uh, therefore has been approved by the FDA to yeah to be used in the in the clinics. Um, but for the rest, I think. The other dendritic cell vaccines are still in their uh, in their uh, development development phase, and it has to be done a lot of additional um, research. All right, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to switch over to Angela. There's a question for you. Um, Angela, an audience member would like to know: Can I make a multiplex panel with markers that I have validated in in immunohistochemistry? Oh yes, that's a that's a good question, and it also brings me a little bit back on the previous question that Julia has taken on the perfect imaging platform. I think Julia has mentioned that uh, you know um, a year ago when uh, she started this work, we were only offering uh, fixed content kits. So basically, you would have to pick among the ones that were available, like the PDL one or the APC kit that uh, Julia has also be using. Um, we have now changed and transitioned to a more flexible content, which means that um, we can develop custom panels um, with markers that we have already in what we call our UView marker menu that I have described briefly before. But um, uh, if you have uh, markers that you have already worked with in uh, IHC, so DAB on uh, paraffin samples, uh, we can definitely work with them and make them in um, uh, in our assay, so develop them for our assay and then eventually um, uh, develop a, a custom panel uh, that includes them and deliver it in the form of a ready-to-use kit. All righty, thank you, Angela. Uh, Julia, another question for you. Um, an audience member would yes. like to know, have you seen have you seen arthralgia, arthralgia or arthritis as IRAE? -E? So, uh, yeah, no, we did not observe um, arthralgia or arthritis as an immune-related adverse event in both trials. Uh, so, this is a no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next question again for you, Julia. Um, what is the reason you think that the immune reaction does not spread from the injected to other lesions? Mm, okay. Um, I don't exactly know whether I completely understand the question. Uh, so in general, I, I, I don't believe that, um, that uh, the immune, immune reaction that we are um, uh, inducing in the injected lesions that uh, this could not um, uh, mount an adaptive immune response and therefore an immune response that um, also 
uh, fights uh, other metastasis that are not injected. Uh, but maybe it's possible that um, the um, guest who asked this question uh, specifically means uh, the case uh, that I am talking about in the in the last case illustration. The patient with its uh, with his um, in transit lesions on his upper thigh that vanished, but uh, uh, in contrast, there was a new lesion um, uh, visible on the on the following PET CT in the neck. So, and yeah, as I also mentioned in my in my presentation, we observed uh, some T cell T lymphocyte infiltration in this lesion too. Um, it's a little bit uh, confronting, of course, because we have seen that uh, the injected lesions, um, also some non-injected lesions uh, on on, the, on his upper thigh, that they um, uh, went in, into regression. Um, however, this lesion in his neck um, apparently does not fully respond respond to this treatment. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of questions. Why this could uh, this could be? Are there more immunosuppressive cells. Is there also a kind of, um, um, yeah, immune tolerance in this in this uh, specific lesion? So we have to uh, we have to look deeper in, into this question. That's a good question, uh, and we will do this. We will uh, perform uh, multiplex immunofluorescence to that end, and probably we we'll also com uh, combine other. Um, techniques um, like mis maybe gene expression profiling to better understand what could be uh, the possible reasons uh, that uh, this cancer lesion uh, does not um, respond to the to this trial treatment. All right, thank you for that. And one last question for you: uh, Do you think that this uh, work uh, or your work uh, would would be suitable for bile duct cancer? Uh, that's a specific question too. <laughs> um, so I think here are two things um, I could think about. So of course, these both trials, um, our proposed treatment, um, and today actually only uh, injectable lesions. So lesions that are amenable for injection are. Um, are considered for our clinical trials. That means they uh, need to be uh, clinically injectable or under under ultrasound guidance, and even sometimes under CT guidance. Uh, I think, uh, of course, if a patient with bile duct cancer, cholangiosarcoma, uh, cholangiocarcinoma, um, if he has he or she has injectable lesions, um, then of course it could uh, be recruited in, in these trials. Um, another thing that I'm thinking about is there are, of course, um, some uh, cholangiosis carcinomas that are um, uh, MSE high, so um, they are mismatch in, uh, instability high. And these um, cancers develop a lot of uh, new, uh, new, new antigens and therefore are more visible for the immune system. And I think especially these patients could have, um, uh, yeah, could develop, possibly develop a nice response under immunotherapy. Um, and also maybe they could have uh, improved uh, results uh, with, a, with an intratumoral administration of myelodendritic cells. But of course, we don't know that today. Alrighty, thank you for that. And it looks like we have time for one last question uh, for Angela. Uh, Angela, how long does it take to develop a custom multiplex panel? Oh yeah, for people that have worked with the multiplex techniques before, uh, I think they would be pretty surprised of how fast we can develop uh, multiplex panels that are really ready to use plug and play. Uh, so for a, for a custom panel, it usually takes about uh, six to eight weeks. Um, which gives you really, it's a very short time that really gives you rapid uh, hypothesis testing. And then, you know, you can have very uh, quick time for um, pilot study or proof of principle before even moving into your actual project. So uh, compared to what we had before, this is extremely fast. We are not talking about uh, 
months or, or years like before, but it's really weeks, a few weeks. All righty. Thank you for that, Angela. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on the GEN website at genengineers.com for up to a year. So if you missed any parts of it, you can watch it again. Or if you'd like to forward it along to friends and colleagues who you think might be interested, we recommend that very highly. I'd like to thank Julie and Angela for their very informative presentations. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention and very thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to all of you for sponsoring this webinar. Hopefully, we'll see you again in another GEN webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now. Everyone stay safe and healthy.